Now, I think there's no doubt that uh, universities have for a very long time been places where uh, unwanted and inappropriate behaviors occur. And uh, just referencing a point that Terry made, in, in part this is because so many members of our community are students, making what can be often a somewhat difficult transition from high school uh, to a different kind of educational experience. And that transition uh, is often combined with the turmoil of being, becoming more independent uh, and with anxiety about what the future may hold and also, I think, a, a sense of uh, newfound freedom that perhaps sometimes encourages us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. And I, I was thinking about this this morning as I was prepping my speech and I was thinking about some of the student pranks that I was involved in when I was an undergraduate that seemed hilarious at the time, but uh, probably had our elders and betters shaking their heads. This is the sort of, you know, the VW on the roof of the administration kind of prank. <laughs> Uh, these sorts of things are harmless. Uh, they reflect the, the freedom that many students feel when they, when they first get to university. But that uh, relaxation of parental control and, and supervision by school teachers that uh, young people have, have come to rely upon, uh, also I think, uh, reflecting back on my own experience, uh, led to some unpleasant behavior directed against fellow students. And the triggers for such behaviors were quite varied. Uh, sometimes out of a passion for a particular political cause, uh, sometimes I think out of uh, fear of individuals who were different. But 40 years ago, just as today, bullies acted selfishly and without regard for the feelings of other people. Another part of our community, of course, consists of professors whom we recruit because they're independent thinkers, critics of ideas, and defenders of academic freedom. We work in an environment of assessment and evaluation, constant assessment and evaluation, in which professors have a lot of power. It's unfortunate that freedom to do research uh, and freedom to publish is sometimes interpreted as freedom to speak or write hurtfully and aggressively against our colleagues or our students or our employees. Again, this is nothing new. Um, if you, uh, those of you who have a literary bent re, uh, and, and have read C.P. Snow's novel, The Masters, based on his experience at Cambridge in the 1930s. This book describes some of the cruelty of the infighting uh, during a college election, in which personal attacks are mounted, malicious gossip is spread, and friendships are broken forever. These are scenes that are still played out today in university departments. Many of us will have seen thoughtless comments written by a professor on a student's paper that with a little more attention could have been constructive rather than destructive. And some of us will have attended thesis defenses where ideological battles between two professors are played out in aggressive questioning of a student caught in the middle of two faculty members' disputes. If these behaviors aren't new, and I'm sure they're not new, I'm sure those of us who have uh, experience with universities for many decades will recognize that this is not a phenomenon of the 21st century. Why do we worry specifically about cyberbullying? Now, I'm definitely not an expert in this, and I've already learned a lot just by attending the, uh, the, the talks this afternoon. But I want to reflect just on two features of, of the internet and the associated technologies that worry me as a university administrator. First is the potential of the wide broadcast of abuse or ridicule. Uh, a few clicks of the mouse allow anyone to send nasty comments or embarrassing audiovisual material around the world. This means that the problem is no longer confined to the institution. Our policies are designed to create a respectful workplace, uh, but they only uh, ap apply to our employees and our students. Once the material gets beyond the walls, once the material gets into the hands of other people uh, who, who don't belong to our institution, we have no way of restricting its further transmission. The impact on the victim is magnified by the fact that the audience for the abuse is unknowingly large. The second problem that concerns me a lot is anonymity. If cyberbullying is initiated by known individuals, we already have policies and processes in place to deal with it. Anybody, though, can set up an anonymous email account, a social media persona, or even a web page. While it's technically possible to identify the owners of such media, this is impractical in most cases except where criminal activity is involved. And anonymity is a powerful aider and the better of harassment, abuse, and bullying. Most university policies require evaluations and reviews to be authored by identifiable people. This occurs, for example, in tenure and promotion cases, in evaluation of graduate student progress, and all the marking that we do of student work. In these situations, most individuals, most of the time, 
are capable of writing their comments respectively and objectively, even if they perceive a fault in someone's performance. In fact, our only significant use of anonymous information is when we conduct student evaluations of an instructor's performance in the classroom. When I was department chair, I took it upon myself to routinely censor all of the student evaluations from every course in my department before they were seen by anybody, including the instructor. And this is because a very small percentage of students write abusive, hurtful, and frankly irrelevant comments as part of their evaluation of their instructor. Comments about appearance, about gender, about visible minorities, and so on. Nobody needs to read those comments. None of those comments need to be transmitted either to the instructor or to their colleagues who are going to review the teaching evaluations. So just as a small number of students use those anonymous surveys to make personal comments uh, and offensive comments, so the new media will encourage a small proportion of people to make harassing attacks and the global reach of the technology allows the attacks to be widely transmitted. University administrators have a responsibility to create a safe and inclusive environment for work and study. We've tried to ensure this by constructing policies and practices and educational processes that are largely reactive to circumstances in which victim and perpetrator are known individuals. I believe that the development of new policies and associated practices can only go so far in dealing with cyberbullying due to the potential for the anonymity of the bully and the ease of transmission of the abuse. What we require is a change in behavior and attitudes. And this is a much more difficult and a much longer process than developing policy or changing practices. The good news is that university, uh, universities um, have been leaders in changing behavior in the past. And I, I won't go through uh, exhaustive examples of this. The one that I think uh, perhaps based on, again, some comments I've heard today that is, is particularly appropriate is the role that women in the academy have played in creating more equal work conditions and in recognizing, for example, that child raising responsibilities should be taken into account during um, career evaluations for professors and for staff. Now, I know we've still got a long way to go with this, but I think we could look back over a couple of decades and see some really significant uh, shifts in attitudes. So it is possible to change behavior. It is possible in a university environment uh, to make people think differently and to act differently. So if bullying behavior has a long history in academia, I think we can start the culture change by consistently opposing bullying rather than by tolerating it when we're in a position to speak up. We can do this by encouraging people to react when bullying occurs in department meetings, in search committees, in seminars, in online forums, at public lectures, or during thesis defenses. We have to tell people that their behavior is hurtful, even if the criticism that they want to make is legitimate. In particular, we need to encourage managers, supervisors, department chairs, deans, and classroom instructors to be prepared to tackle this bad behavior head on. Uh, Natalie Sharp referenced the importance of the role of the bystander. Bystanders can be people in positions of power who let bad behavior occur. And it's those people, I think, who have authority and respect uh, to whom we must look to, uh, to set the example for everybody else in the university. If we create a climate on campus that will not tolerate this behavior in face-to-face -face situations, we may make people think twice about taking the activity online. Thanks very much for your participation today. Really appreciate the thought and, and uh, hard work you're putting into it.